Well, how's everyone doing this morning? Yeah, yeah. You know, I made a big mistake because you guys know that I preach pretty hard, and so I sweat when I preach. And I've told y'all that I that I make this place into an ice box. I wore a flannel shirt today, so uh, I, I can't make any promises what I'm going to look like after the end of this service. This this service is is my favorite of the month. God has been so gracious to Henderson. To build church, we have baptized every month for the last five months in a row. It's and listen, listen, that's got nothing to do with me. That's got nothing to do with Ryan. That's got nothing to do with Chloe or or the people. And it's got listen. That is a hundred percent the Holy Spirit moving. That's what it is. And so we're we're going to hear um, three amazing stories of life change today. And and I wanna go into baptism for just just a second about what we believe here at at, at Hendersonville Church. Number one, baptism doesn't save you. Um, There's nothing that that baptism does to earn you a right relationship with God. But baptism is exponentially important for for three main reasons. Uh, Number one, we're gonna do, as followers of Jesus, we're going to go where Jesus goes. We're gonna do what Jesus did. We're gonna love what Jesus loved. We're going to despise what Jesus despised. Jesus was baptized. Jesus was baptized an example of what we are supposed to do. Secondly, it's a beautiful depiction of, of what happens with us. And Jesus commands it. Remember, his great commission, go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And as far as next moves, which we measure success here as life change. That success here at Hendersonville Church. It's not numbers, it's not number of likes, it's none of that. It's life change. It's legit undeniable life change that can be attributed to one thing and one thing only, the Holy Spirit of God moving on this earth. That is it. That is success at Hendersonville Church. And baptism is a beautiful, beautiful depiction of what takes place in your heart. You are baptized with Christ and you are raised. We were once walking dead people. And I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, therefore... If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In other words, when you're baptized, you are showing your church family and the public what Jesus has done for you in your life. You are literally recreated into his work of art. Your past decisions, your past, what people have said about you have absolutely zero bearing on that. The only thing that matters about you is what God says about you. And when you repent and place all your trust and faith in him, you are literally recreated. You're regenerated. You're reborn in the Holy Spirit of God. That's the truth. And so it's crazy. You know, a lot of people ask, well, you know, one thing I'm particularly excited about is who's actually doing the baptizing today. You see, I'm not baptizing anybody today. And I am pumped out of my mind about that. You know why? Because the people who have influenced these people that are getting in this tub, um, they are the ones that God used to lead them into a relationship with Christ. You know, Paul's literally writing to the church in Corinth. Uh, There's a lady named Chloe. And and her people go to Paul and say, Paul, there's divisions in in the church in Corinth. And some people say they belong to Apollos. Others say you. Others say Peter because of who baptized. Paul says to them, man, I thank God I didn't baptize any of y'all. What is wrong with y'all? It doesn't matter. What, who should do the baptizing is who has played a dramatic role in that person's life. So here's the deal. There's probably 170 people in here. Hey, guess what? Y'all go out and you be the hands and feet of Christ and someone sees your actions, and God uses that to draw them in by his spirit and saves them, guess what? That's 170 people that need to baptize. I just saw a whole bunch of people nod their heads, so let's get out and do it. I'd love for every single person here who is a follower of Jesus 
to lead someone into a right relationship with Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And then you sit up here and you have the honor of baptizing them. That's discipleship. That is next level multiplication. And let me tell you something that gets me fired up. I love it. So um, at this time, I want to go ahead and ask Ronnie and Juju come up. And uh, I, wait till you hear these stories of life change because they are incredible. Hi, my name is Juju and I would like to share my story. It all started when I was seven years old and I started to go to church, but I always thought it was boring. I would fall asleep most of the time, but by the time I turned nine, I started to pay attention to some of what was going on. When I would come home from school, all I would hear at home was some big argument about stuff that didn't matter. Often it was my grandma causing a ruckus and my mom would sometimes fight back and it was always so aggravating to hear everybody fighting. One day DSS showed up at my school and a couple hours later, I was in foster care. At that, I was really scared about all of this, but over time I started to get used to a new family. Our foster parents started taking us to church and I enjoyed it, but I didn't really understand everything that was being said. Then we were on lockdown due to COVID and we started having house church at home. And that's when I started understanding more. I started to pay closer attention week to week. And when the restrictions were lifted, we started going to Hendersonville church and it was great. I went to a couple of camps and the last one I went was a youth camp at Biltmore Church. It was the first night there, June 26, 2021, that I got saved and accepted Jesus personally. Before that night, I constantly felt like something was missing from my life. I was always mad and cussing and even going to church felt like going through the motions. Now I talk to God a lot and want to do better in general. I pray for real, I, I pray for real and I want to worship and I miss it when I don't get to go to church and do those things. I haven't had an easy life and have lots and have lost lots of loved ones. But because of God, I have been able to make it through. That is why I love Matthew 19, 26. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. I'm getting baptized today to let everyone know that I follow Jesus. Jennifer Gonzalez. I had a wonderful childhood and a very loving family. I was brought up in church, and by that, I mean we were the ones that sat in the front row each week. All of us knew that we needed to behave and be good in church, and if not, we knew we were going to get it. All joking aside, I had the most supportive and loving parents and brother a person could ask for in life. I knew from a young age that God was real. And I believed in Jesus. I was sprinkled as a baby in our church, knew that I should be good, but to be honest, my life didn't always reflect what I thought I believed and the way I was raised. I did all the church things as a child, but just doing things didn't mean that I was always on the right track. It wasn't until later in life that this relationship with God would become much more personal. In high school, I was very athletic, but also very out of hand. I ended up becoming pregnant and making the choice not to carry out the pregnancy. That choice was very difficult, and I felt like for many years God punished me for that decision. Not even a year out of high school, the same boy, who of course at that time I thought I would be with forever, was tragically killed in a single vehicle accident with two of my other friends. This made me question my faith, and I was very angry at God. Unfortunately, I turned to drugs for comfort, which was not the proudest moment of my life. I was looking and searching for comfort in all the wrong places. I thought I found love again and ended up getting married, but that was very short-lived and ended in a divorce. My personal struggles were only growing stronger and I refused to turn to God. 
because I was still so angry with him over everything that had happened in my life. I still had so much personal shame and guilt that kept me from even allowing God to play a role in my misery. Then I met Vincent, the man I would marry and be married to for 20 years. I found my true love and I couldn't be happier. We were blessed with the most amazing girls. Lord knows we were far from being the perfect parents, but we were blessed with the perfect girls in our life. Our marriage wasn't perfect and there were times of unfaithfulness, but we were able to see through that and work it out. Even through the hard times in our marriage, I thought this would last forever. I was wrong again. Earlier this year, my marriage of over 20 years came to the point of separation. Although this has been very painful and hard, it has made me realize how much more I need God and the amazing blessing of the daughters that came from this marriage. Often, as a parent, we think we are the only ones protecting, encouraging, lifting up, supporting, and strengthening our kids. But I never realized how much God could use the faith and spiritual strength of my two daughters to encourage me to follow Jesus personally. See, I've watched both of my daughters go public in baptism recently, and they have been the most amazing reflection of God to me. They have encouraged me through their lives to be bold in my faith and to stay focused on following Jesus. Without their support and encouragement, I would not be up here today taking this next bold state step in my faith. Since coming to this church, which, by the way, my daughter convinced me to come to, and experiencing a more intimate relationship with God, I have been able to have a real peace that I haven't experienced in a long time. I know without a doubt that Jesus is the Lord and Savior of my life, and because of that, I know my next step is to go public in my faith in baptism. I'm getting baptized today to let my daughters, my family, my friends, and my church know that it is never too late to put your trust in God and walk out his plan for your life. West. As a little girl, I prayed every night that God would protect my daddy and take the drug addiction from all of my loved ones. When I was 14 years old, my father died in a car accident, and that is when I lost all faith and began using alcohol to cope through the pain. I rebelled in anger against God, so I left home and quickly decided I could only depend on myself going forward. My teen years were very difficult, but I always had a plan and I had the determination to make it happen. Even though I was running away from God, I thought I could still have a successful life and even believed I had built that success for myself. Now I know that even though I had given up on God, God had never given up on me. When I was 27, God blessed me with a precious gift, my daughter. Having her literally saved my life, and I finally stopped abusing alcohol. I realized during this time that I was an unready single mother with this beautiful child that was going to need me to be there for her. Four and a half years later, this God-given gift led me to this church because she wanted to know more about Jesus. Here I quickly found God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. It happened so fast and all of a sudden, I was saved by the grace of God and knew without a doubt that I was a child of God and that he loved me so much. This is when the true battle began. Immediately, my life got harder. I started struggling with my depression again and a few months later, my family and I faced the worst thing we could have imagined. We were instantly separated, homeless, escaping floodwaters with barely any of our possessions, and with no idea when things would ever be normal again. Our children suffered through pain and emotions no child could rightly process, along with the constant battling with agencies and resources to receive assistance. Even through all this chaos and uncertainty, 
I have found unbelievable peace and joy, knowing that my Lord has a plan far better than the plans I had. God has shown me his love every day through my struggles. He speaks to me, and I have learned to listen. I never could have imagined I would be experiencing the faith, joy, and peace I feel right now, given the crazy circumstances we have gone through. I spent most of my life as a non-believer, and now I have literally been reborn into a new creation. I am beyond excited for my new life with God. I know that he will continue to guide me, and I can't wait to see the beautiful future he has planned for me and my daughter. Um, I've got a, I've got a glimpse into into some of them firsthand, and um, man, you can't attribute it to anything else but God. Um, Kayla, the one that was just baptized, she's they've literally lost everything. When the floods came through about two three months ago, um, they barely had enough time to get out with their own lives. Um, there was seven feet of water over her house, and and to see the peace. Um, that this young lady has. Um, pray for their family um, because they're going through a lot. Pray for a little girl. Um, she doesn't understand. I, I'm 46 and I don't understand. Um, and then with, with Jennifer and, and Riley, I'll never forget about five months ago, this girl I'd never met before named Riley came up to me right out here with this solemn look on her face and she said, I must be baptized as soon as possible. I was like, Oh, okay. And I know her, I know her boyfriend and his family real well. And, and they came. And, and here's the thing. God works in two ways. He works in miracles, which I, I got to be honest with you, those don't even really surprise me anymore. He, he's God. I mean, God could make this building levitate 87 feet in the air on a 45-degree axis right now if he wanted to. And it'd be nothing for him. Nothing. But then there's another way he works. It's through his providence. It's through his sovereignty. And for whatever reason, he uses us in that. And so you see, it's funny because I went to school with Jennifer, the, uh, the second lady that was, or the first lady that was baptized, second person. We went to high school and she couldn't believe I was a pastor. Because um, I guarantee you, I was voted most likely not to succeed in high school. And I'm just living proof that God can take a mess and make it less of a mess. And so... Listen, these stories have been amazing, but they all should point to one thing and one thing only, and that has a name, and that's Jesus. This platform is meant for Jesus Christ and him crucified. And we're gonna remember that right now with communion. And so I, 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 wanna, I wanna go through communion because I feel it's important that we understand what communion is and why it was absolutely required of the local church to do it. And so the, the, the most scripture that's, that's really referenced is in 1 Corinthians. And so Paul goes into it in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also, also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant. Say new covenant. New covenant. Say it again. New covenant. In my blood. Say in my blood. In my blood. Okay, I'm gonna talk about that. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Say, until he comes. Okay, so Jesus says in remembrance of me, it's a new covenant in 
his blood. What, what does that mean? How did it happen? Because 2,000 years later, people still feel a little bit uncomfortable about talking about the blood of a man. And Jesus said things that didn't make sense 2,000 years ago. He told his followers, unless you can eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be my disciples. It sounds pretty crazy, doesn't it? And so, but I, it, I think it's important that we unpack why communion is so important. And so when we talk about the night he was betrayed, it, it was the Lord's Supper. And in Matthew 26, 38, he says this. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And so the Greek there, it suggests a sorrow that's so deep it can, it can kill. And he was in complete anguish. And where Jesus says right there, watch with me, the Greek there is, is really like one of our values, unbreakable unity here at Hendersonville Church. It is where he wants his disciples to bear the burden with him, to, to, to literally fellowship and share in his pain and his anguish. And, and I love Luke's account in Luke twenty two forty four. 44. Listen what Luke says here. He says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Say earnestly earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now that earnestly, that, that Greek word there, and I talked about it about a month ago, it's ectonos and, and it's a medical term. Luke was a, was a physician and he used a medical term there and that medical term means to stretch a muscle beyond its capacity. So Jesus was on the ground, and, and it begs a question, we as his followers, if we're going to call ourselves followers of Jesus, when have we gotten on the ground and stretched our mind, heart, body, and soul beyond its capacity in prayer to Jesus? And that's what he did. And his sweats became, the sweat became like drops of blood. That is another medical condition called hematridosis, where under intense stress and pain, your capillaries can burst and, and the blood gets into your sweat glands and it can come out and you literally can sweat drops of blood. It's rare, but it happens. And so look at verse 39 of Matthew 26. He gives a little bit more, more insight on this. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Three times he prayed this prayer, begging God to take this cup. He was sweating drops of blood. He was stretching everything about him beyond his capacity, crying out to God. So why, what was the cup? Why was Jesus so sorrowful? I mean, what, what is it? Because here's the thing. He calmly said it multiple times prior. He literally told his disciples, hey, guys, listen, uh, we're going to go to Jerusalem. Uh, and I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests. And then they're going to hand me over to the Romans. And then, and, and then they're going to flog me. And the way they flog in those days where they had this, this instrument that typically had nine leather strands on it and it had little chips of bone and glass on the end of it. And, and what they would do, they would tie you to a post and they would make you get down like this and, the, and the, they were trained. The Romans were trained, ruthless people. And so they would, they would hit you super hard with that. And it wasn't the lashings that were so painful. It was the fact that those shards would stick into your torso. And then what they would do, and they, it, there's numerous reports where they would do it with like vengeance and couldn't wait. They would then rip it. And so it wasn't uncommon for your organs to be on display through your rib cage. Do y'all understand that? That's what Jesus did for us, Okay. A lot of people died during that, but then he had to carry his cross. But here's the thing. He could calmly talk about it. He's going to be delivered over and be crucified. And then three days later, I'm going to raise from the dead. So, so why was he sweating drops of blood? Why, why was he so, because here's the thing, martyrs throughout the year, I mean, these people just got baptized. I just read an article where three people were beheaded over in the Middle East because they were baptized. And they knew it. I mean, they know the life expectancy of a newly baptized believer is very short when they get baptized. And yet they did it. Martyrs throughout the year have been skinned alive, burned alive, beheaded, hung all the time for Jesus. And they're fine with it. So why was Jesus, what's the cup to which he refers? Because here's the thing. He was crucified at 9 a.m. 
and he gave up his spirit. He died at 3 p.m. So for, for six hours, he hung on that cross. And the pain is excruciating. More than likely, everybody who was crucified was crucified completely naked. And people would have been spitting on him. And he's praying for God to forgive these people, by the way, which those people are us. It's me. I'm those people. And so the pain is excruciating. So we pick up in Matthew 27, 45 that gives some, some light on it. It says, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until about the ninth hour. That's from noon to three. So from noon to three, the world was completely dark. That signifies judgment, okay? Then we hear what I think is one of the most staggering sentences in all the gospels. Listen what Jesus says in Matthew 27, 46. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lima shabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is everything. This is the cup. This is one of the most prolific verses, arguably the most prolific verse in all of scripture. And it's one that we must bow in reverence before, yet try to, compl- try to understand as best as our finite brains can. Because here's the answer to what the cup was. It wasn't the scourging. It, it wasn't the fact that you could probably see his kidneys while he's trying to carry his cross. It, it wasn't the fact that they had put that, cro- that crown of thorns so deep in his scalp it was pressing against his skull. It, it wasn't him watching the nails made out of the very alloy he created get driven through his body. It wasn't that. No, 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 no. It, it was basically Jesus was begging God. He knew in his human brain that for the first and only time in eternity, there'd be a separation. God the Father would separate himself from God the Son. God would make him sin. And God would pour out all his wrath on Jesus Christ that all of us deserved. Praise God. That's what we celebrate at communion. John 1.1, 1, 1. here's the deal. It says, in the beginning, in other words, before the foundation of time was even created, was the Word, capital W, that's Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. It is undeniable there was an eternal bond between Jesus and God the Father. Jesus perfectly obeyed God the Father, perfectly loved God the Father while he was on this planet for 30 some odd years. But in his human brain, because remember, Jesus was fully man and he was fully God. And in his human brain, He had no idea what that separation would look like. He had no idea that he was going to become sin. He didn't know what that was gonna look like. That's the cup. That's the cup. The verse that explains this so well, 2 Corinthians 5.21, I strongly recommend everybody in here memorize it, embrace it, and know what it means. For our sake, for our sake, In other words, God had a plan in the beginning with us in mind. It's how stinking much he loves us. He, meaning God the Father, made him, meaning Jesus, to be sin. Who knew no sin. So that in him, listen, we don't receive anything. Remember baptism? We talk about what it was a picture of, a new creation. No, no, no. We're a new person. We become God's righteousness. I don't care if you've abused alcohol. I don't care if you struggle with with a drug addiction. I don't care if you struggle with racism. I don't care if you struggle with chauvinism. All those are horrible, horrible sins. Pride, envy, lust. Listen, when you are following Jesus, you become God's righteousness. Meditate on that. Embrace that doesn't mean those other sins of of racism, of chauvinism, of pride, of envy, of lust. It doesn't mean those are okay. No. But when you start grasping that, you start getting rid of all that mess. You're able to. You're able to start leaving it in the mirror because you know who you are in Christ. One more thing we got to be sure we understand. In John 19, 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said... He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, that's three words there. It's only one in the Greek, tetelestai. Say tetelestai. Okay, so tetelestai, it's an ocean of meaning in a drop of language. Tetelestai had two meanings back in that day. 
The first one was when there was a massive debt that had to be paid, and it finally got paid off, there was a stamp by the Roman government, and that stamp was the Greek emblem that meant to tell us that I paid in full. It had another meaning. When there was years-long wars going on, the victor, when he finally killed the king, and he captured the king's crown, he would say, to tell us die. It was a battle cry. Let me tell you something. Jesus died a victor on that day. That was the greatest word uttered by the greatest man on the greatest day in all of history, because it's finished. It's done. The war's over. We won. Y'all realize that, right? It's over. We've won. Satan, death, hell, the grave, sin, it's all defeated. There's one more thing I want us to talk about before we partake in communion. Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five. 25, he said this, in the same way he took the cup. After supper, he's saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, a lot of people, again, think that's a little bit cringe to say in my blood. But here's the thing. Blood with pretty much every single belief system has been the common denominator of sacrifice. In order for there to be an appeasement made with something that was sacred, something had to be killed. And so the concept of, of sacrifice involves the death of a victim for the, for the maintenance of a relationship to continue with a supreme being or anything we consider sacred. And so blood equals life. And so basically in Leviticus, which is a hard book to understand, but it points so beautifully to Jesus. God, God gave us blood. It says right here in Leviticus 17, 11, for the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is by the blood that makes atonement by life. So here's the deal, the Jewish nation, there was blood running everywhere all the time. They were sacrificing lambs constantly trying to appease God for their sins and having to constantly and constantly and constantly do it. And the writer of Hebrews gives us such a beautiful insight about this. He says in Hebrews 10, three, he said, but in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. You try harder, you try harder, you try harder. How many of you feel like you keep trying and you keep failing? Okay, that's the Jewish law. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The first chapter of Hebrew, verse 11 and 12, and every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away the sins. But when Christ had offered for all time, all time, a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Wow, no more blood sacrifices needed. It's over, it's done. Praise God. And here's the other thing that's beautiful with that. Remember it says no more? So basically that writer of Hebrews continues on in verse 10 and he quotes God when he's speaking to Jeremiah and he's quoting Jeremiah chapter 10. He says this in Hebrews 10, 17, then he adds, talking about God the Father, Yahweh, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. I don't care what you've come in here with. I don't care. But Nathan, you don't understand what I looked at last night. I get it, it's wrong. And when, you, you, when you're in the Holy Spirit, you'll start being able to get rid of that. God chooses not to remember that. He made a choice not to remember our, our sins or lawless deeds anymore. Please don't miss that. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Amen. It's finished. God is holy. He cannot be around sin anywhere. That creates an infinitely humongous problem for us because we are sinners. And he made a choice with us in mind. And that's why we remember Jesus' death. The old covenant was all about law and trying and doing better and doing better. With Jesus, it's a new relationship where we come to God as our father. We don't have to perfectly keep to a law or a set of circumstances anymore. But we need to take this very seriously. Because Paul continues to explain the gravity. Look at, uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians 11. He doesn't mess around. 
Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself and so eat of the bread and of the cup. And listen what he says here. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now, here's the thing. This gives us an opportunity to repent of things and, and to make right before God. It, it gives us the opportunity to do a self-reflection of have I wronged somebody? Have, have, I, have I committed sins of pride? What have, have I not placed God first in my life? That type of self-reflection. Am I, am I idolizing other things other than God, be it my kids, be it my job, whatever it is? Because here's the thing, you're entitled to your own set of opinions. You're not entitled to your own set of facts. You're not. Jesus is Lord. Period. He's Lord. The decision is, are you going to live your life like he's Lord? Or are you going to live your life like your kids are your Lord? Or your job is your Lord? Or the stock market's your Lord? Or your house? Or whatever. How, how are you going to live your life? That's, that's between you and God. Here's the thing, though. It's not just about looking back. Communion's not just about looking back. Remember the very last verse in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. Listen to what he says. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, what? Until he comes. Let me tell you all something. Jesus is coming back. Well, Nathan, when is he? I, I have no idea. And by the way, if you think you know, you're playing God, that's a real dangerous thing to do. You don't know. You don't know when he's coming back. If you think you even have a semblance, you're trying to play God, cut it out. I'll just say that because this does not tell us. Jesus Christ even chose to not know when he was going to come back when he was on this planet. He said, only the Father knows. Now, he knows now, obviously, because he's back in heaven with the Father. Here's the thing, cancer, I hate cancer. It ain't going to have the last word. Viruses ain't going to have the last word. Politics ain't going to have the last word. King Jesus is coming back, and he will have the last word, and he will make things right. But here's the thing. We best be getting ready, but we look ahead. We look ahead. That's what we remember. We remember Jesus' blood that was spilt, the fact that he had to be separated from the Father, the fact that he was sin on that cross and God poured out all his wrath on him and he's coming back. That's what we remember about communion. So at this time, uh, Keith and I think it's Ron and Jim, uh, if y'all can go ahead and um, grab the elements. Um, and y'all can just, uh, I think Jim's gonna be back here. And Keith and Ron will be right here. Um, what I'd like, as you go to get your elements, so Jim will be in the back, for those of you in the back. Um, what, I'd, what I'd love for y'all to do is as you, as you grab your elements, as you grab them, thank Jesus for his blood. Thank him for his blood. Thank him. And I know that sounds odd. And listen, if this is your first time here, or if you're not a follower of Jesus, listen, that's fine. Who can take communion at Hendersonville Church? If you're a believer and you've confessed Christ as your Lord and Savior and you've repented, you're more than welcome to partake. Here's all I ask. If you don't believe in Jesus, I mean, you're not a believer, just you invite judgment on yourself if you partake in this. So I'm asking you to just remain seated. And I, I, I hate to sound exclusive or whatever, but, but Scripture's clear on it. This is my authority. It's not the culture in which we live. This is. So if, if you're not a believer, I, I just you, you do us respect, you do God respect by just not partaking of the elements. So at this time, um, if you all will, go ahead and everybody stand up. And where everyone is, is closest, just uh, grab your elements.
out some different uh, elements which are a little bit more convenient. I um, want to make sure I make everybody happy. Um, you guys know me well enough to know I don't care about that. But anyway, um, so basically, if, if you will, just go ahead and peel the part uh, with the bread back. can just everybody hold this up just as a as a reverence to our Lord and Savior who was all alone who lived a perfect life and became sin for us and he said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, for I received from the Lord would also deliver to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me let's eat and remember and rejoice basically turn the cup over and and peel back just enough to sip out of it. This represents the blood, the necessary atoning blood. Jesus said in 1 Corinthians 11, 25, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new covenant, no more sacrifices, no more trying harder and harder and harder every day in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink, remember, and rejoice in our Savior's blood. God, thank you for what you, your word teaches us. God, thank you for continuing to move in and around Hendersonville Church. God, as we sing this song, as we sing this beautiful, beautiful song, God, oh, the blood, let us reflect on what Jesus did for us, God. Let it ignite us. Let it rejoice us. God, let it convict us. Let us truly reflect on what our Lord and Savior did for us on that day in Calvary.